You know when you really should do something, but then that voice in your head is like, ah, uh, you can do that tomorrow. A little too familiar, right? Well, it just so happens if that thing is starting a fasting protocol to improve your cellular and metabolic health and thus longevity, you may want to start sooner rather than later. And you know, I don't just expect you to take my word for it. That's the data's job. Yo, 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 what is up? Welcome back to another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and longevity and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic manner. Today, we are once again exploring if the point in time we start fasting has any impact on its cellular and metabolic magic. And yes, I do understand that all of this would imply that there is some magic in the first place. Where if you've been around here before or explored any of the 50 plus videos on the Fasting 101 playlist, you know, I for one believe that structured meal timing is one of the best tools we have in the longevity toolbox. We're talking a glucose stabilizing, insulin sensitizing, sirtuin activating, autophagy stimulating, stem cell reawakening, inflammation mitigating, fat adapting tool. Kind of like a cellular and metabolic Swiss army knife. Now, here's the thing. The intensity and efficacy of these effects vary based on a number of different variables. Meaning two people can have very different experiences while following a similar protocol. Making meal timings true effects hard to really quantify across the broader population. As current state health, protocol type and duration, diet, sleep, exercise, and environment all play a substantial role in influencing an individual's outcome. Thus, why the data on the topic is kind of all over the place. But despite all this, what we know is across our growingly sick population where it's estimated nearly 85% of adults are dealing with some type of metabolic dysfunction, pulling the lever which is consistent meal timing typically has a beneficial cellular and metabolic response. A response which can potentially be dampened when applying this intervention later in life. You know, the time in which the majority of the population is undergoing a deterioration in health span, being somewhat disabled and debilitated from doing what they truly love, what fills them up and brings them joy from this very life. Yeah, I know, doesn't pass the vibe check. So what do we currently know about this later in life impact? Better late than never. When it comes to the effects of macro timing on the efficacy of a fasting protocol, there's a couple of things you gotta know. First, it's just not an easy topic to study in humans. Not only are we highly environmentally unique out here in the wild, but gauging the impact of late in life fasting compared to early in life fasting is just straight up difficult because, well, we live a long time. And thorough fasting studies haven't really become mainstream in the health and longevity world until the last few decades, leaving a pretty nice gap before we can even attempt a study which followed people early enough to tease out if applying a fasting protocol later in life changed any outcomes. So what do we do? I mean, we're kind of in a little bit of a predicament. Well, I can only tell you what we have done, and that is turn to animal models and data to date on our favorite four legged cheese loving friends has displayed that there is in fact a difference when fasting is applied later in life compared to earlier. Let's explore. In one study, which we did a full video on here, mice which followed a dietary restriction protocol their entire life, lived the longest and were the healthiest compared to mice who ate at libidum or switched to a dietary restriction protocol later in life. Hmm, interesting. Another study which explored the late initiation of a every other day fasting protocol to mice at 20 months old, which is estimated to be the equivalent of 55 to 65 years of age in humans, found that the fasting protocol led to improved components of frailty, including beneficial changes in body mass composition, glucose metabolism, neuromuscular performance, and hippocampal dependent memory. These improvements were observed in many 
male mice on a standard chow diet composed of 24% protein, 58% carbohydrates, and 18% fat. Basically highlighting that in a very controlled environment, when mice go from ab libitum eating of normal chow to a fasting protocol later in life, there seems to be solid cellular and metabolic upside in many key markers of longevity. Pretty cool, right? But let's be real. If we're going to attempt making any broad connections to humans here, which in and of itself is a stretch no matter the parameters, we need to better align with the modern day human diet. High fat, high sugar, ultra palatable crapola. Sorry, I mean, it is what it is. I wonder what would happen if the late in life fasting intervention was applied, but the mice were eating a modern Western diet like the one just mentioned. Which brings us to the new data. To answer this question, researchers out of the Cleveland Clinic performed the exact same experiment, except the cohort of male mice used here had been kept on a high fat diet containing 60% fat since two months of age. And at 20 months, they were divided into a high fat diet ad libitum control group or a high fat every other day fasting group for two and a half months. And during this time, measurements of physical, metabolic, and cognitive components of frailty were gathered. In this model, the mice became obese and metabolically unhealthy across the 18 months of their adult high fat diet life and then were given the fasting intervention while, might I add, eating the same crapola diet. And remember, 20 months for mice is estimated to be somewhere between 55 and 65 years of age for humans. So what happened? Well, first off, there were some benefits. Generally speaking, the positive effects of every other day fasting seen in the previous study were consistent in this one. The fasting protocol decreased total body mass, improved glucose tolerance and utilization, led to better neuromuscular function, and a higher ratio of lean mass. Huh. Not too shabby, huh? Now, that being said, these outcomes were numerically less favorable when compared to the protocol applied in the previous study with the normal chow, but nonetheless, pretty damn impressive given the older age and continued crappy diet. Now, that being said, again, there were some outcomes that were not carried over. In contrast to the previous study, grip strength, hippocampal dependent memory, and renal hydrogen sulfide production were not improved by the fasting protocol. All pretty important markers to gauge healthy aging in an organism. Which makes me ponder, why? Well, researchers hypothesized that the impact of this fasting protocol in late life likely depends on the nutritional composition of the background diet for specific functional and cognitive improvements. Oh. They add, these results indicate that exposure to the long-term high-fat diet irreversibly removes the ability to improve muscle strength, cognition, and renal hydrogen sulfide production at advanced ages. However, it does not impair improvements in glucose tolerance, body mass composition, and spontaneous activity. Oh, thank God. I, I thought they were going to lose spontaneous activity for a second, and that would have been game, set, and match. They continue to interestingly say, alternatively, it may require a longer dietary intervention than two and a half months after a lifetime of high fat eating. And it may just be a slowed process for improvements to be observed. Similarly, the use of a more human relevant 45% high fat diet versus the 60% used here could possibly shift the results and mirror what was obtained in that previous low fat diet study. All good points. And as you can see, a lot to unpack here. A perfect time to explore what the hell, if anything, this means for us humans. Well, first off, it means that all of this seems to be true in rodents, which do not happen to be humans. Although, some humans do classify as rats, but we digress. As I mentioned before, doing this kind of research and controlling it well is a near impossible task in humans. Thus, we need to try and draw associations by other means. Point in case, these animal models. 
The only thing that we can truly conclude at this point in us humans is the fact that structured meal timing, i.e. time-restricted feeding and intermittent fasting, do things. Good things, generally speaking, at the cellular and metabolic level. The kicker here is, and there's always a kicker, this one has a particularly good kicking leg. <laughs> the extent of those things vary based on all the different aforementioned variables. Thus, there has been no official formula created that can actually tell us what the optimal dose of fasting is. Timing, frequency, duration, and minimal effective dose. Likely because it's highly personalized. And we just don't have the data to support any conclusions in long-term outcomes in humans. Now, what I think this data does give us a glimpse into is the overall impact that habits throughout life have on our ability to see beneficial outcomes later on. Meaning, the data to date, as well as the data we covered in previous videos, suggest that the longer we fall into the trap of modern Western lifestyle habits, i.e. ultra-processed diet, sedentary lifestyle, deprived sleep, misaligned body clock, all glued together with a gaping nature deficit, the harder it is to experience positive outcomes from healthy interventions later in life. The key word here being harder not impossible. As we've seen in this research, as well as other data highlighting the very beneficial impact of exercise later in life, positive outcomes are still attainable. But there may be some limitations due to decades of neglect. So to answer the question, do the longevity benefits of a fasting protocol decrease in effectiveness as we delay it to our later years in life? We just don't know for sure in humans although this data certainly suggests it's a possibility. And knowing what we know about the overall beneficial effects of structured meal timing, I'd suggest noodling on the following cautionary approach. If you are an adult, which I'll define as 25 years of age and older, and you have a vested interest in longevity, AKA doing everything that you hope, wish, and desire till the very, very end, then today, it's probably a good day to start observing your current eating habits and exploring how you can potentially add some structure, something like a daily time-restricted eating protocol, breaking your day into feeding fasting windows ranging from 6 to 12 hours of feeding and 12 to 18 hours of fasting. If interested, you can see a glimpse into my current strategy here. And I'll also link a guide in how you can get started in a safe and sustainable way in the show notes below. Because as you can see from this research and all the other data that we've covered on this channel, there is a lot going on at the cellular level when we alter our meal timing. Longevity magic, which is not shown on a scale. More energy, enhanced thinking, better mood, happier gut, deeper sleep, clearer skin, and more health. I mean, why would you wanna wait until your golden years to experience that? And that's not to say that a fasting protocol is a silver bullet, and it's certainly not your get out of metabolic disease free card, but it's certainly proving to be a powerful tool in the toolbox. A tool, might I add, which seems to have a greater longevity effect when implemented earlier. So get building your future, remember, when it comes to your health, there's no better day to start or continue investing. Well, I mean, except yesterday, and I guess for that matter, the day before that. Good thing we know how to reverse biological age.